Welcome to the next episode of Lost in Criterion. I'm John Patrick Owatari Dorgan, and I'm joined by the Adam Glass. Welcome, the Adam Glass. Well, thank you, Pat. Welcome to you as well. This week we are talking about Tokyo Drifter, the 1966 uh, Seijun Suzuki film, uh, a little more comprehensible. Oh, uh, I think a lot more comprehensible. A lot more comprehensible than what we talked about last week, Branded to Kill. Um, and still, I, I, I like the movie better. Oh, I, I certainly like this one better. I like this movie better, but I understand why the other one is should be considered more influential. There's way more scenes in the other one that are kind of fuel for a budding director's mind yeah. than this one. This one has some cool scenes. I really like the scene yeah. where he burns his car. I don't know why I like yes. that, but I really love that scene. But there's, there's fewer movie, of those in this one. Yeah, this movie has a more sort of conventional film grammar to it. Um it's it's much more a straightforward plot. It's much more of a plot, um, and it uses it uses. It has more the same plot from techniques. the beginning to the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, but it has more, more more conventions, or at least its unconventionality is within a realm of conventionality. Well, and that's I, that's so, why I certainly like it better. Is when I want yeah. when I have a film being unconventional, I would rather it yeah. keep a few of the hallmarks of. Filmmaking. Yeah. It's still doing things you understand. Right. So that I have something to latch on to. Yeah. Which is yeah. the main problem with the other one with Brandon to Kill yeah. is that there's almost no anchor to hold yourself to. You're yeah. just adrift. Yeah. Whereas this For one, instance, we one, have of the, one of the one of the most unconventional things about this movie is 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 its its use of black and white into color at the beginning. Which I the really, movie itself I like. is, is I, vivid color. Yeah. But it's yeah, I like it. It starts off in a very high contrast uh Black and white. Which was... Which worried me for a second. Yeah, me I thought too. my video was off. Well, see, yeah. I was worried. Um, I was like, oh, no. He's being really weird. We're going to watch an entire yeah. film of overexposed... Yes. Having like, having oh, watched no, Brandon no. to Kill first, you were worried. It, like, it was going to be really awful. Terrible was happening. I was like, yeah. oh, God, I don't want to watch an hour and a half of this. Yeah. But we, we, we watch... Uh, it's a couple minutes, oh, and, you know. It's, and it's it works thugs. great. It's... Yeah, it's thugs accusing Tetsu or, or trying to get him, our main character, back into the game. And he says, no, we've gone legit. We're not. The organization isn't. Which brings them to the conclusion yeah. that because they've yeah. gone straight, they can do whatever they want. Yes, yes. Um, so these guys these guys try to get get him to turn. And, you know, they talk about his former abilities. And when we get that flashback, is in color. Which is a great effect. It's little splashes of color, not even like full color, but but you know. And then uh, and then they beat him up and knock him out. And as he's knocked out, we get you know it's it's very conventional, but it's still it's still well done um, when it's done. Uh, as he's knocked out, we get sort of silent scenes. Uh, we do a little pass on the city. We see we see um, just silence and very little life you know, of the train yard. And then we start to hear the birds again as he wakes up. Right, and then we um, go straight smack dab into color. Yeah, scenes with of Tokyo. Opening. Well, not not quite not quite smack dab, mm-hmm. but but certainly living um, with the opening credits. But but he he slowly wakes up and then sees that that little. It's still in the black and white. There's this red. Oh I think it, yeah, I forgot about that. Like buried in the dirt. It's like a. It's, it's a thing. Like a, it looks like a toy gun. That's what I thought it's, it was. It's gun. Either it's a gun half buried or a toy gun, um, but it's in in vivid red. And then we cut to the opening credits, which are in full vivid life color. And then uh, we start the music, the glorious music. The glorious music. The the wonderful soundtrack to this film. film. Honestly, for me, the soundtrack is what does it for this film. Yeah. Except for the the weirder parts where where he starts to sing the theme song. I like that. Or some approximation of the theme song. Well, it makes the the movie more of a musical for a second. Right, but I like it. odd. Well, I like it because it's weird because it's hard to tell if he's singing it or not. Because there are times after he starts singing it when it's impossible for him to be singing it and it's still going on. 
Yeah, like, where he's still singing. <laughs> like, yeah. he starts yeah. singing it while he's walking, right, in the snow, in that one yeah. fight in, like, Hicktown, USA, or Hicktown, Japan, which is the yeah. way I thought of it. He starts walking, and he's singing, and then he gets in the into a spot where it's impossible for him to be singing it, and it's still going yes. on. But it's still going on as well. And I love that. I love I love it when movies blur the line between the soundtrack and what the characters are actually doing. Yeah. I love it any no, I, I love I, any I will say right now I love any and every eighties movie where the soundtrack at some point is represented as coming out of the radio. Yes. Where they turn it off. Or... Yes, where like it's playing and then we cut to the car and it's it's on the stair I love yeah. it. You do that, you yes. win me over. It doesn't matter how bad your movie is. <laughs> You've got me. Didn't we talk about? We once talked about making a short film where where every every, <laughs> every scene, single scene incidentally, is, incidentally, is, is, naturally yeah, is within the scene by occurred the... blinded by the light. Where they they they're listening to it in the car <laughs> and they get out of the car and walk into a store and there's a Muzak version that picks up right where it left exactly. off. Exactly, it would be beautiful. Yeah, we should do that. We should. <laughs> Someone should do that. Some, not yeah, us. not us. Somebody who actually has <laughs> filmmaking talent. You should do that. <laughs> someone doesn't have to be blinded talent. by the light. It just needs someone to be continuous. With, someone with someone with filmmaking talent would never do that. <laughs> no, I would enjoy it because I, that's a thing but, I yeah. love in films. And yeah, some, well, no, but you're certainly you're certainly right that the synthesis of soundtrack and uh, oh, it's perfect and action in this movie is is very well done. It's is, it's yeah. for me, it really yeah. is the main factor of the film like if it, yeah. if it didn't have the soundtrack it had i'm not sure i would have actually enjoyed it i yeah. it's hard to and tell that's, that's very important to this movie it's very it's very you know a lot of the movie takes place at like the jazz club you know it's very it's very invested in its music yeah. within the within the movie's universe too um not overly invested it's not like our main character is also a rock star but right right yeah it's it's um, not um what is it um Top secret. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, here's something I would Rebecca really love Rubonte. to know, but I don't have the information on hand, which is awful. I would love to know if that song was made for the film, or if the movie is named after the song that it features. Um, I'm gonna bet made for the film. I'm gonna bet too. Yes, but if it is made for the film, somebody did an excellent job. <laughs> I just I just scrolled down the Wikipedia article because I had it open from before, and there's a, there's a section marked soundtrack, and then a box that says, says this the section, section is, is empty. empty. I know it's so sad. I saw that and I was like, oh, <laughs> crest fallen. Oh, uh, oh uh, no. But uh, yeah, there's regardless of whether yeah. or not it's for I the film or not, I really it's feel, wonderful. Technically, technically, this is a better done film. I think. Oh than, yeah. On, on a normal, on a normal conventional basis, I mean, we can get avant. We can argue that that Brandon to kill was going for. He wasn't actually going for something avant garde. Suzuki has said so himself. He just wanted to make something entertaining, and just didn't understand. Doesn't understand how people conventionally make movies. <laughs> what fun um, is the definition? Yeah. Of he's like, I <laughs> looked in the dictionary. We had a few false starts. <laughs> And we really figured it out later. I don't mean that. No, he obviously knows what fun no, it is. No, both of these, both of these movies are fun movies. Oh, but this one is so um, much. I, this one was so enjoyable for me. Like, like I said, you know, it, it was really fun. I, yeah, I just I enjoyed it. the music. Really yeah. fed me throughout the entire film. It really kept my interest a lot of times. Kept me from yeah. drifting too far away. Um, <laughs> this movie. One thing I really love about this movie is that the main bad guys are almost like a '60s Batman. Oh, bad I guys. know. Like, but like everything kind of has that feel. It, their headquarters is in the back of a jazz club. Oh, I know, right? Like they're almost a morality it's, tale. It's ridiculous. It's directed. It's direct. Uh, like everything's decorated with like these fake like, uh, like Roman motifs in the wall. Oh, I know. <laughs> it's. It's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, except for the fact that they're not thematically dressed themselves, even though the main, <laughs> I wish the main they bad had. guy is, is He's... always in like this red suit. He looks like the devil. He He's looks like always Peter. wearing sunglasses. He looks like the devil from from Bedazzled, the original Bedazzled. He looks like the devil from that. Um, I just repeated that sentence four times. Yes, you did. <laughs> but but yeah, but yeah. I mean, they're 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 ridiculous, but not like but they're not like 
don't get me wrong, they're not as individually over the top and campy as as any any 1960s Batman. Right, right but was. they are they have that just that tinge of campiness. Yeah. And things get really yeah. campy at the Sasebo uh nightclub uh, the the Sorry, that's oh, that that's only about an hour flight? from my house, but like uh, not the nightclub, the city. Um yeah, it, the extended bar fight. Is yes, that what we're talking yes. About? That's right. I was trying to think where of a way the, to describe it. Yeah, the cabaret, the Western cabaret. Yeah, where the, where the Navy where guys gets join in the really fight. Really weird for like <laughs> five minutes. It turns into something you'd see in like um, yeah. It's kind of like a Batman. It, yeah, it's kind of like a Batman like fight scene like, meets Looney Tunes. Yeah, and then like all the chorus girls uh, get the get the sailors' attentions just to hit them over the yeah, head. Yeah, it, it makes them like. <laughs> March in line. And, and it's really all, weird. Yeah, they all march in line and then fall in unison. It's 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 very it's very um, Batman meets Looney Tunes. Yeah. I mean, it's almost it's almost like airplanes. It it's is. It like, is. A, it is that off the yeah. wall. Well, everything about that fight scene's off the wall. And what they mention in the yeah. Wikipedia is something that you I noticed as well. Is in that one fight scene, people aren't getting injured. They're fighting, yeah. but they're not. They're they are in cartoon land for about yeah. whatever, however many minutes. They're in that wonderful world of violence without injury, and it's weird. Yeah. It's really, and then they all get piled up outside at the end. It's weird, and then it turns yeah. into a real fight scene with guns, where people can die. Yes, yes. it's so yes. wild. It's like, there you no, get rid of the, you no... get rid of all the uh, the goofy. Looney Tunes guys, and it suddenly just turns into a fight scene. It's so weird. Let's read too it. much into that. Read too much into that about the the United States Navy sailors make it all uh, Looney only taking part, only taking part in a, a Looney Tunes esque scene in a jazz club and jazz cabaret. It, and I then, don't know what it's supposed it gets to back, mean. It gets down, down to brass tacks and and actual violence. <laughs> well, but it's weird because everybody, including the Japanese guys, are participating in this. Yeah, yeah. It's not like it's just them insane rock. It's just everybody's. Yeah. It's like he wanted to make a full blown fight scene and then decided that yeah that was just too much or something. I don't know. It's and, weird. But it's it's not the only the only like super weird thing, obviously. No, like I but said, like it's one whole... of the ones that like stands out because it's like the longest yeah. extended example of just a bit yeah. of non reality in the Well, the entire premise is kind of non real. But like yeah. I mean it's well, that really... weird that weird uh, surrealism. Yeah. Like the the there's an early scene um where um just after, just after the rival gang has has uh, done everything to ruin uh, Tetsu's gang, I can't remember the gang. Tetsu, name, so. Tetsu, Tetsu. Yeah. Um, um, it is just after. Oh, I forget the name of the gangs. It yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, now I'm gonna have to go look it up. Oh, s- it's not important to what I'm about to okay. say. So, um, they when they first uh, when they like capture him. When he, yeah. he figures out what's going on and goes to scratch, they they like leave the room and look like they're getting on an elevator, but they push the elevator doors close themselves, and then he runs after them and just falls. 30 yeah, feet into down a hole. It's a fake elevator. It's so it's weird. It's a fake elevator. Um, I don't they understand. Him it's, so just it's so weird. It's so it's weird. It's like such a weird prop to have in your in your <laughs> yes. secret hideout. Like, well, oh, well, this happens all the point? time, so we had this installed. Yeah, apparently, apparently they capture people like that enough to necessitate the building of that. Yeah, essentially it's a punji pit. Yeah, <laughs> with, but without the poles at the bottom, it's just a hole. Yeah. So by the which way, is really, I would like which to is really it. James Bond. That's what it is. This is this is really. It's almost a half half a James Bond parody at points. It is a little bit. It's like they really are like they're like Bond villains. They are. They're yeah, like. They're, they're like. That kind of that one weird. I forget who was the Bond at the time. That weird era of Bond films where they get <laughs> goofy and campy. Yeah. To the point where they become almost unwatchable. Um. <laughs> that was that was Roger Moore. Yes. Was steady. Yeah. Steady. Um, steadily toward that. It's um. <laughs> the weird thing is, I realize. Okay, first of all, this is one of those one one of those films where I almost could even enjoy a remake of it 
just to update it. But it's it's a great yeah. film. Um, one of the things I noticed though about it that really made me kind of laugh to myself is the fact that the entire plot would be completely ruined if somebody had caller ID. <laughs> yes. Nothing yes. in the film could happen if people had caller ID. If anyone knew who was actually calling. Yeah, or even like, apparently they had call... ears because the voice yeah. impersonations are yeah. terrible. The voice impersonations are terrible. Like, uh, the secretary calls from the street yeah. and says, oh, this is me from his office. And it, you know, they might actually recognize her voice at least, but still, she's clearly not at the office. Yeah, you can hear cars um, and stuff. But, like, yeah. oh, by the way, that character, that secretary, secretary? I... Is it poss- Is it bad that I wanted her to die almost from the moment as we like met her? the only woman in the movie besides the uh, Chihado, the, main character's yeah. girlfriend? Yeah, but like it's um, bad. But like yeah. she was so irritating. She was. I, I mean, know that we're supposed to not like her, but man, because she's she's. But we're supposed to not like her because she's evil, not, not because, because she's, she's annoying. annoying. Yeah, exactly. Like the whole time I'm watching, I'm like, God, just somebody shut her up. I was waiting yes. for her to get slapped, is what I was waiting for. I didn't expect her to get shot, but, um, <laughs> you know. I really, I just, I just read this, and this is great. Uh, obviously, Branded to Kill is a black and white movie. Mm-hmm. Um, that was punishment um, from the studio. They took away his color privileges. Uh, Why? Because of, because of this movie. Really? See, this uh, one, yeah. I like. This one's good. Yeah. Yeah, but it's still it's it's slipping into or it's slipping toward absurdity. And, oh, and but it has like, that really just it's just a tinge yeah. of it. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. This one's this one's really fun. But apparently, uh, the uh, the Japanese businessmen in charge of this weren't interested in fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't imagine that being true. Yeah, but like oh, this no. at, at the time, this is you see that's that's a classic case of your your studio not being in touch with what's going on in the world around them. Because that's that's right in the wheelhouse of 1966. Yeah. Those those tinges of absurdity mixed yeah. into otherwise normal things. So I don't know. No, this was yeah. This is there's a lot of fun going on in this movie. Yeah, and I and I really legitimately like it. Yeah, but I'm not sure yeah. if it crosses the boundary into one of the ones I would buy. But it's if somebody. It's one of those ones where I'm re- every so often I'm really glad that we've seen one because it gives me something really weird to talk to people about. And this yeah. is one of those. It's just just strange enough that I could recommend it to most people, and I think they would like it. Yeah. But not so strange that they're going to look at me like I'm a lunatic for the rest of the time that I know them. <laughs> because if I say, if I recommended Brandon to kill somebody. They would just be like, "Are you serious?" Yeah. But like this one is just a, just weird enough, while also in a weird way, almost kind of being touching in a in a couple spots. Like you can actually empathize with the character at a, at, at points with the main character, yeah. As his like you know he's super loyal to his boss, and then his boss just throws his life away to redeem his own life. And it's, yeah. it's 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 um. Good film. Okay, we're done talking about it. <laughs> we can't be done in podcast. Twenty minutes. minutes. Um, now, now, one thing I, I mentioned this briefly in Red and to Kill. And I think it's definitely more true here. Uh, there's there's a very set visual style to the framing that I feel is really uh, really uh, uh, stage influenced, theater influenced. Um, this one, this movie, this movie in general, I think has a more, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, continuous, continuous visual style. Yes, I it think. does, and and that helps and, it. It keeps yeah. it all connected. It's more, it's more coherent in its visual style than Brandon to Kill is. Um, but yeah, it's very, especially during that bar fight. Oh, scene I know. It, but, but other scenes too, well, where it's very, yeah. it's very. We're at the fourth wall, and the fourth wall is not changing. It's very. Well, I really one of the things not, I really enjoyed yeah. about it is the fact that you were talking about stage like how stage like yeah. it can be. I love how often it seems like characters walked in off of stage right or stage left. Yeah, it reminded yeah. me of um, 
No, oh, it's gone. Uh, <laughs> Kurosawa film we watched, kind of crime related. Seven, high and low. Yes, high and low. In that, okay. high and low was more that yeah. way, for sure. Yeah, high and low. High and low living, is the like, living room. The living room scene in High and Low is definitely staged like a stage play, and it has because it has it has its little pockets of action at stage left, stage right, and, and right. Center. But this one has um, feels like that. Like for example, I'll give you an example. I have a very specific example of from stage right in mind. Yeah, we are at uh, Yoshi's, the the real estate agent's office. Yes, which by the way, who runs a real estate agent from a building a room that looks like that? Um, but okay, so we're there, right? And the yeah. only person there are Tetsuya and his boss, uh, Kurada. Yes. Or Kur- Kur- I forget his name. Um, uh, now I have to go look up his name. And uh, what's his name? What's his name? Uh, I've lost it. It's gone. Um, really? Now I can't find his name. Uh, Kurada. Kurata. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, they're in there, right? And then the bad guy's... Or maybe I'm forgetting. Now I'm getting confused. <laughs> but like, um, no, now it's slipping away. Um, so they're there, right? Hold on to it, Pat. You can do this. They're there, and oh, I remember. No, uh, Tetsuya is not there. Okay, it's while he's yeah. trapped at the bottom of the pit. Okay. Okay. Yes. And uh, Kurata, the his um, his boss is there, right? And they come in and kind of surround him, right? And he walks out the door. And then the other bad guy just walks straight in off of camera. And, like, shoves him back into the room. Yeah. The character just comes out of nowhere. Not as if he's walking in a door. No, he comes off of stage right into the scene to do this action. And that's all he's there for. Anytime the character comes... Well, he does it a lot. The character comes in to the scene after the scene starts. Rather than yes. before, and it's I like it. It's it's weird. I like it though. It's weird, but I like it. Is is something I think we're going to say a lot <laughs> about this film. <laughs> yeah, well, it, about it's it's film. no balloon ride up into the heavens after after a <laughs> yes. shootout after killing someone, <laughs> but it is still enjoyable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, this uh, this movie. Well, I think we should. I mean, like, yeah. There's, I mean, we can just in general just discuss the scenes we like. Like one of my favorite scenes is him destroying his car. I do not know yeah. why I like that scene, but that scene is really amazing to me. We we cut to like the burners b- like blasting with fire, and we see it get yeah. smashed. And I don't not know why. I assume that's supposed to be him throwing away staying in this place like he's yeah. leaving he's he's completely separating himself even though he's about to become a drifter so the car would be useful it would be for really him. useful as a drifter yeah but it's Japan there's trains everywhere yeah he doesn't really need a car especially not one with a crazy paint job like that yes um, but yeah no it, that's a really amazing scene to me and I don't really know why it's so amazing but it is um, uh, but I really I, I like how he's so so Definitely and completely destroys the car to the point where it's almost like a piece of it's almost like a piece of pop art by the time you're <laughs> yeah. done with it. You know, like, it's like you could have just it's parked it somewhere. But yeah. no, he destroys it. Driven it off it. a bridge or something. Give the but keys he, to he somebody. He burns it and then crushes it and then Yeah, it's yeah. gone. There is no car anymore. And then like I don't there's a couple other scenes that kind of had a similar feel to me. I mean, obviously, there's the bar fight, but that's not as serious. There's the scene, like I said, where he's walking uh, in the snow before the shootout yeah. at the yes. kind of really old style Japanese house, and that's really impactful. I really like that too. Yeah, I think the the quiet scenes in the snow are always always delightful whenever they they come up in a movie. They come out in in Japanese cinema a lot. I think. Yeah, they do. or at least or at least in in as much Japanese cinema as I'm familiar with as well, say, as he knows familiar with. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's about the same amount I'm familiar with. I don't get a lot of yeah. I don't do a lot of Japanese film watching. Um yeah, despite the fact that I could uh, certainly at my disposal. Um what yes. I will say is that um it's a weird thing about that place he goes. I'm not sure. Yeah. 
I still had, I was not able ever to catch. I watched it like three times. When that place is attacked, okay, the one, uh. the one bad guy, like one of the main bad guys, shoots one of those swordsmen, okay? They're in a long hallway. This is one of those scenes that's set up 100% like a Japanese stage play, okay? we got this long yeah. hallway, and we've got the guys rushing with swords from the one side and from the other side, and, then, and one of the bad guys just shoots one of them. Just straight up yeah. shoots and, like, shouts, like, something like, you stupid peasants or something like that, right? I'm not yeah. sure exactly what we're supposed to take away from it, but w- my impression of it was to... In this weird way, kind of suggests that the people up there were like total hicks. Yeah. Okay. I mean, they're very like they 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 fighting with samurai get... swords in a place in like an era where there's guns everywhere. Or yeah. Like, well, not maybe not everywhere, but you can get them. And they're fighting yeah. with samurai swords, to, and they try to get our, our our hero to help them because they want to be a better gang. But they're just they're they're so much of a bad gang. Yeah, they're exactly. Fighting they're fighting with swords, and it's this weird <laughs> like I don't. I was like wondering like I don't really know anything about that area. Is this supposed to be commentary? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Is this maybe... I think it's just it's it's not Tokyo, so it's yeah. Well, like there's this weird implication there in this film that anywhere in Japan that is not Tokyo is. Stupid. Well, we get that we get that in American cinema a lot with things that aren't New York or <laughs> yeah, that's LA true. or stand but, direct stand-ins for New York. But or it's LA, not something so. I've experienced in the limited amount of Japanese cinema I've watched, and that's yeah. what made it kind of amazing to me. Is like we when they go up to that one northern area with all the snow, uh, it's just a bunch of hicks, and when we go down to really as far down south as we can or pretty far down south and get to um the uh <laughs> to where the navy base is it's just a bunch of yeah. uh stupid american navy people and i yeah. i find that whole thing was pretty funny to me like it's like yeah but it was it's more blatant than you would normally expect yeah and i yeah. liked it no it's true um one thing i really like one scene i really like is the final the final fight in the uh, the pure white room, um, mainly because it's a pure white room, and that's just ridiculous. that is ridiculous. <laughs> I like it like, too. That's, a, that's another like that's that's another like a Bond villain, uh, right? Like who has a room like that? You sit there going, huh? Was there a piano in it, or am I? No, just there was a piano. A There's piano. a piano. Yeah, because they make because the scenes kind of flow together in a weird way a lot of times in that yeah. like. There's not a lot of clear separation between like one element and the other, which is I think part of why people like uh, the their the studio heads may have not liked it. Um, yeah, is that like for example, when we go into that like his girlfriend is being forced to sing there slash possibly start a relationship with the bad guy. I'm not really clear yeah, on that. There's very much an implication that he's that going the bad to guy rape is, her. Is, yes. Uh, Harrowing her. Yeah. And so, and like, talks about training him and stuff like that. And then, so she starts to sing. And that she is, her piano player is also dragged there, which I guess he's being harrowed as well for his <laughs> piano playing skills. I'm like, where did maybe, he come maybe. from? Um, yeah. So he, she, dra- or is that supposed to be a remodeled version of uh, Kurata's. Building. Is that is that what the jazz I, club became? No, because ja- the jazz club belongs. Management? The jazz club belongs to the bad guy. Yeah. It okay, whatever yeah. because we never really see what Kurata was doing with his. Well, yeah, we do. We see it is a like a more of a nightclub, not a nightclub. Um, more like a jazz club. Did, did you say jazz yeah. club? I'm getting confused. I saw jazz. Club. I'm sorry. Okay, so the but, what I meant is that that weird dance hall is the bad guy's place. Yeah. And then, yeah, I think that that's supposed to be Kurata's jazz club, where she usually sings remodeled under new management. Yes, you're right. And <laughs> maybe I think it's supposed to be the same place. I'm not clear on that. And but it's weird because it flows straight from her being forced to sing into him shooting everyone. And so we do get a shootout in, in this weird Bond villain lair. It's in all white. And it's pretty lovely. But, yeah. 
<laughs> it's, it is. It is. It is a great fight scene, but there yeah, most yeah. other than the fight in the bar, most of their fight scenes are better in this one than they oh. are in Branded to Kill. Because yeah, the Branded no, to Kill fight true. scenes are they're, bad. They're, they're bigger in this one too, though. I mean, every 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 fight involves more people. That's than, true, and that helps any, a little bit. Well, any fight in Branded to Kill. Yeah, and I do. Uh, I, do I do find it interesting that that, that backwoods gang. Uh, Managed to successfully get him, uh, save him from being arrested. Yeah, but in like the sloppiest way possible. I'm like, in, a, in an incredibly sloppy way, yes. But then at the same time, uh, goes goes into the next fight with uh, with just just with swords. Well, the way they um, protect him from being arrested is they just basically keep pushing the police officer. <laughs> they get into like yes. the saddest fight with the police officer ever. <laughs> Yeah, it's more. It's it's a numbers thing, I think. More than like, but there's no reason well, the police officer shouldn't be fighting back. Well, but he's not. He isn't. So, I, it's weird. It's. I don't know. Maybe that's uh, maybe maybe he's a corrupt police officer, and they've already bought him off. So or he doesn't feel like this is a situation where he starts shooting random people. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I don't know why. Because he's because uh, a wanted that man is escaping. Seem... Yeah, but I don't know. One, uh, I don't know, uh, that? where shooting random people isn't a good idea doesn't seem to be, uh, doesn't seem to be a convention for any movie I've ever seen. That's true. So. And, and then, frankly, these are people who deserve it. But, um, but you almost get the impression from that group of, of, like, hick, uh, mob members, like, hick gang, yeah. almost that, like, even... I don't know why. Maybe it's because of the scene with the police officer. I get this impression that, like, even, like, the locals are like, ugh. <laughs> These guys are a joke. Like, the police let, officer doesn't want to shoot... Let them do whatever they yeah, want because the police officer do doesn't want to shoot Davey from down the road. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I can't. I'm not going to shoot All right, him. we'll let you continue to pretend you're a gang. <laughs> but that's what it kind of feels like, right? Like, the police officer yeah. lets him them steal this guy in this super sloppy, just kind of, like, jokey kind of way. And it's like, oh, he knows these guys, is how I felt. When I was like, I was like oh, he knows them, not because he's corrupt, but because he grew up, <laughs> like, in the same town as them. And he doesn't want to just shoot the dude who's, like, like they're all, his like neighbor's they're all kind of daughter. slow, and he's just... Yeah, it's almost like a humoring a bunch of idiots, his, yeah. It's his, his neighbor's idiot son. So it's like, like oh, I can't shoot him, I'll never hear the end of it. <laughs> I'll have to bring over, I'll have to bring over some, like, snacks and, like, stuff to his house, a bottle of, like, wine to apologize... Ugh, it's not worth it. Just too much, too much work. <laughs> yeah, it really feels like that, though, to me. I don't know no, why no, I, I did, but like when I was watching, I was like, "Oh, he can't shoot him because they're just the idiots from the town." That like, uh, yeah, everybody maybe, already knows maybe. they're quote unquote starting a gang. I don't, I don't care. I don't care what the actual reason for anything in this movie was. That is now my head cannon. That is now the truth. Yeah, it seems like it. It's felt like it to me. That's what it felt like when I was watching it. It's like oh yeah, those guys again. I do like I do like that in that movie uh, or in that in that scene right before he's captured. I think it's that scene uh, where they're they're kind of having a little standoff. Him and the cop on the train tracks. Mm-hmm. I might be uh, yeah, uh, and the train is coming. No, that's a different one. Um, oh no, no, it is later. Yeah, that's but anyway, uh, I do like during that, that scene where too. the train's coming. During that during that scene when the train's coming, they're completely unconcerned about the train. And, yeah, it's weird, but it but it also never gets closer, so it's okay. Yeah, and it's green screened in the background. Um, yeah, yeah, it's really weird because there's very obviously actually a train approaching in some of the scenes. Yeah, and then there's very obviously not a train approaching in some of the scenes. Like the close up yeah. shots, I I guess maybe he only had the one camera. Maybe because maybe. like in the far away shots, there is an actual train rolling down the track but then in the close-up face shots it is not a train there is a green screen train in the background well yeah rear projection well yeah but the point is it's at such a crazy angle that it makes no sense yeah yeah it's like not it's like over his right over his left shoulder yeah the train the train would have to be 10 feet above the tracks and directly behind (laughs) yeah to even Uh, remotely be close to where it's supposed to be yeah and so like 
you know, I mean, chalk that up to budget constraints, but uh, it's I do like every he does it twice, as far as I can tell. His weird like counting the space thing, yeah, based on like objects, and I guess that's supposed to be to his ultra hitman skills, but I'm not sure I ever quite comprehended. What exactly he's doing. Yeah, like he's trying to figure out the space he needs to cover to um, shoot effectively. But, like, he uses the slippers in the one shot and then, like, the um, train tracks in the other one. But I'm like, yeah, you can't tell how far away. I don't know. He's like, oh, that's 10 yards. it's, it's, it's it's, It's meant to help us, I think, as viewers, but... Yeah, it doesn't really make sense. Well, it'd be, it be um, it would make more sense if somehow like it showed up way more often. If we see it, if we saw it like five more times, we'd be like, "Oh, he's got some weird like savant skill for like <laughs> if he gets within this range, he's unstoppable." Which is what we yeah. seem to see in those two scenes, but because we don't have enough evidence to back up that that um, supposition, yeah. we're left with the idea. Well. Yes, he just likes counting train tracks and looking at slippers. And this yeah. is what it comes down because we just don't get enough data. We don't get proof that he's like some sort of like within this distance, never, ever, ever, ever misses. Yeah, yeah. Um, Which is an absurd prop, uh, supposition, anyway. That like, oh, well, as long as right. I'm within this distance, I never miss. If I'm one foot out of that distance, I become a stormtrooper. Yeah, can't hit well, the broadside of the barn from the inside with the door closed. Why not? Why not? Yeah, that it's be, it's it's it's, it's, a, it's a thing that There's happens no in movies not that's not so. real. But yeah, it's yeah. it's okay. It's yeah. absurd, but it's okay. But it only happens twice, so we don't know. Um, so one one thing I think we can talk. We already mentioned that this movie treats its women very very poorly. <laughs> yeah, well, because uh, it's, it's a it's a it's a yeah. It's a 60s Japanese Yakuza film. It's a film. 60s movie. It's about men. Oh, it is 100% <laughs> about men. That poor lady, yeah. his poor girlfriend. I Yeah. Um, I felt so he, bad for he her. He just kind of leaves. He, he he leaves without really telling her why. Yeah. Uh, then, then she gets ki- she, kidnapped as part of the deal for... for right. Uh, the, his that boss also includes sells him being her. Yeah. Which is madness. Like, yeah. this is the 60s. Yeah. It's Japan just, had a feminist... This is really... This, this, Japan had a feminism movement. I cannot imagine that this was a very popular idea. I can't either. And then, and then at the very end where, where uh, he... You know, essentially, while he has also taken the time to exact his revenge, he's also rescuing her in the process. Right, but it almost seems uh, like, yeah, he rescues her, but then yeah. doesn't want... To be with her, well, yeah, like he incidentally rescues her. He's really just concerned about his revenge. Well, and, and then, I'm okay and, and then tells with her, that. Yeah, I'm okay with yeah, the fact that he t- doesn't want to be with her anymore. That's a thing that happens, right? Yeah, I I am bothered more by the fact that like she is basically sold, yeah. and that like he doesn't give her any reasonable explanation ever. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think my problem, if I have any problem with that ending, is that his his reason for not wanting her uh, is that uh, he's now he's now a wanderer. He's now a loner, Dottie, a rebel. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's uh, yeah. And it's just, he has no reason to continue to be a wanderer, I think, is where I am. Um, and he hasn't really... I don't know how much time this movie covers, but it doesn't seem like it's enough that he's hopelessly addicted to the uh, wandering lifestyle. Wanderer lifestyle. Well, yeah, but I think we're supposed to take it as that way. But you know, at the at the same po- point, I guess that's that's kind of traditional within this sort of story. You know, we get that with uh, with the samurai movies too. With uh, well, and I think that we're really getting borderline into some Japanese culture here. Yeah. Which is, yeah. I, I which I do not want to speak out of turn on, but uh, <laughs> what I have observed in my real life acquaintances, as well as in films and storytelling here, is there's a real 
especially in a certain type of thinking and a certain type of movie that sort of samurai like i don't need women women are yeah a detriment kind of yeah. philosophy and i think that he has taken that philosophy and is yeah supposed to be a model of it and i so that's why it doesn't bother me too much because I already know, I've already seen that <laughs> yeah, so many times. But, but my experience with that sort of philosophy is is uh, sex or the trappings of being with a woman are a distraction to my work. Right, and he has no more His work. work. He he has yeah, he has no work. Uh, yeah, but then again, I think he's supposed to be played slightly as a wandering samurai now. Oh, now yeah. he's. He's started the wandering lifestyle. He's just going to go from town to town, fixing rights. Yeah, he's turned into putting putting right. The ones went wrong. wrong. Yeah, he is. He is. He (laughs) is. It is. What's the name of? He is now Doctor Sam Beckett. Yeah, Sam Beckett Um, from Quantum Leap. But I mean, he. It is that though. I mean, that's what they want. That's the final conclusion of his character. Whether we like it or not, is that that's what "quote unquote" he's supposed to be? Obviously, obviously, by the title, he is supposed to become the Tokyo Tokyo Drifter. Drifter. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, is that like we see it because he saves his girlfriend not because she's his girlfriend, but because that's what he does now. Yeah, it has that wandering samurai thing going on. He's been betrayed. So now he's not he's no longer a member of a gang. He doesn't do things that are wrong anymore because he's not he he can go straight. But his version of going straight seems to be putting right right what what's it wrong. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I guess if we got more of that. Well, we don't know enough. We don't see what happens after. He walks down a white yeah. tunnel and then we're done. But um No, I just that's how I read. It. That's how it read as me is, "Oh, look, We've made a wandering samurai. Thank you, Japanese culture, for doing this to me again. And that—that's what it felt like to me. It's just like we've, we've, we is to me the most stereotypical thing that happens in the film. For the most part in the film, we actually operate in my mind fairly toward the outer limits of those sort of stereotypes, and then suddenly the end, we just really seem to embrace it. So, but that's just my feelings. Again, I don't want to speak out of turn about Japanese culture. That's okay. I don't want you to get can. beat up. Um, no, just make about sure pe- no one listens about to this people episode. who love Japanese wandering samurai style films. Yeah, and I mean they're probably very violent people. Well, it's also kind of interesting that what I feel like is we've seen the very very. Usually in those kind of films, from what I remember, we see kind of the creation of the character, and then we see his actions. Yeah. What All we see is the, at the very end is we see his creation. We never see what yeah. he does. And I think yeah. that's kind of cool. I think that's a different take on it than what I'm used to. And so that in that way, it's kind of interesting. We see his birth, and if, I, if this were modern American cinema, I would say, oh, look, they've set us up for a sequel. Yeah, but I don't think there's a sequel to this film. <laughs> no, I could um, be wrong. Man, if if for no other reason, because he was almost immediately fired. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. He made two more movies, and I don't think I don't think the other movie other than Branded to Kill was a sequel. To this. No, they said that there was one sequel to Branded to Kill, though. Really? On the Branded to Kill website, I'm pretty sure, or on the on the um, Wikipedia page, it's a yeah, sort yeah, of I sequel, don't. but not really. Is apparently what it was. A half-hearted sequel. Yeah, kind of connected. I don't know how you make a sequel to uh, Brandon to Kill, but um, just more yeah. balloon rides. <laughs> That's what yeah. my sequel to Brandon would, go, would, be, would just be like a two-hour documentary on hot air balloons. But, um, you know, <laughs> this one, yeah, like I said, if it were anything else, I would feel like, oh, somebody made a prequel to maybe, yeah, not even a sequel is set up, but this is the prequel to some storyline of a wandering gunman. But it's not. It's just self-contained. And I I like... I can't say that I like that he just ditches his girlfriend, but I understand the archetype. Yeah. 
Yeah, within within the archetype, it's under, you make a good argument for that, and I'll agree with you there. Um, I, yeah, no, you're right. You're right. It's we'll it's not it. great. Like I still, I don't, it bothers me that it happens, but eh, his his do? his own his own justification for, it's, for it's silly having that lifestyle <laughs> yeah. is silly. I yes, think. I agree with that one hundred percent. But wanting to have that lifestyle or feeling that he's he's within that lifestyle, I guess I can understand. Yeah, I uh, I like to imagine now a kind of universe where within like a month later he's back. It's like oh yeah. that did not work out. So yeah, I think I think we've got about as much as we can say about this movie. But you think? Yeah, yeah I think we're really, yeah. I'm, yeah well, I think we pretty cover it. It's good. Yeah. I would. It's the it, yeah. if somebody it's really wants. Yeah, if anybody ever asked me about Japanese films, which has happened in the past, yeah. I now have one more film that's an example of a new director that I didn't know much about to recommend. Yeah. Yeah. And I then that's nice. I like something that, having that. Something to recommend that isn't Coruscant. Exactly. Me, Same here. I can't yeah. cuz uh, Brandon to Kill was not that. But this one yeah. this one fits firmly into that that wheelhouse and I like it. So. Well, speaking of speaking of great great directors and movies to recommend. <laughs> oh, uh, are you leading into our, our next, next episode? Film? Our next episode, um number 40. On the Lost oh Nigerian, man! Uh, what a what a DVD wonderfully list. round number. Yes, Armageddon. Michael My Bay, God, 1999. Um, Can we just talk about we'll, time uh... bandits again? <laughs> no, we can't. Oh. Uh, and actually, we'll have a special guest for that. Uh, Ooh. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, and confidant. Really, uh, See your confidant. No, not really oh, confidant. Okay. But... He is my lawyer sometimes. No, not legally, but he's. <laughs> but he anyway, is definitely a lawyer, uh, just not mine. Stephen Stephen Goldmeyer will be joining us, and uh, we'll uh, assuming he wakes up. <laughs> go, you just go set set a microphone in there in his room next yeah, to him we asleep. Could. He'll probably he might talk in his sleep. We'll find out. Anyway, join us next time for Armageddon, uh, which I hope will be as ridiculous an episode as it is a movie. Oh, I think um, we got plenty to talk about. Yeah, so we'll see you next yeah, time. See you next time. Thanks. to Lost in Criterion, a production of With Two Brains. The show is hosted by Adam Glass and John Patrick Owatari Dorgan. Jonathan Hape did the music, and Adam Glass also edited it all together. Feel free to contact us by email via lostincriterion at withtwobrains.com or join us on the web at www.lostincriterion.com.